Our scripture this morning is from Colossians 3, 1 through 12. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, is, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways that you once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself now with a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, seethen, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Amen. Central to the Christian faith is resurrection. I had uh, uh, Maria and Dan put together an image for us this morning that talks about how resurrection works in our lives. And so, Dan, if you could put that on, please. There's three different ways that I'd like you to think about resurrection this morning. The first has to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Every uh, Easter, we gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Every single Sunday is meant to be a mini-celebration of Christ's resurrection. You know, in John's Gospel, we hear the story of the, the resurrection story uh, according to John, and we're told that it was early on the first day. It was early on the first day, while it was still dark out, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Jesus had been uh, crucified, uh, died, and had been put in this tomb. And Mary came to that tomb to pay her respects, and when she got there, she saw that the stone had been rolled away. Immediately Mary ran and she went and got Simon Peter. And Simon Peter and another disciple came to the tomb and discovered, yes, it was empty. And Mary was greatly distressed by that. But in her distress, in her tears, in her grief, she was met by Jesus. She met the resurrected Christ and it was this faithful woman, the first one to lay eyes, lay eyes on the resurrected Christ who was instructed to go share instructions and news with the other disciples. So part of the first corner, the first triangle of, of, this, of this triangle has to do with Jesus' resurrection. Now there are also the scriptures talk about the general resurrection of the dead. It's the resurrection that we look forward to. And it's the promise in scriptures that each and every one of us as God's beloved children, uh, also can be resurrected to be with Christ in the world. And so the other peak up there is that general resurrection. Unlike Jesus' resurrection, which is historical and which is in the past, this general resurrection for us is something in the future, and it's something that we look forward to. But there's a third form of resurrection, it's the spiritual resurrection. It's the resurrection that we experience today in our present lives. It's the resurrections that God's people have known throughout history. And you notice where that resurrection, I have placed that in this image. Where is it? It's down in the valley, right? It's down in the everyday places where we find ourselves trying to make our way in this world. You know, sometimes we look at those mountain peaks and we think that that's where uh, sp the life of faith is lived. But actually where the life of faith is lived is actually in our day-to-day -day lives and the messiness of all of the routines and the circumstances and the places that we find ourselves in. That spiritual resurrection is just 
one of those defining characteristics of what it means to be in relationship with, with God. And there's story after story of that spiritual resurrection taking place. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well? Absolutely one of my favorite stories in scriptures. We're told that Jesus is traveling with his disciples and they've gone into town to get um, uh, provisions. Jesus stops at this well and he has an encounter, a meeting with a Samaritan woman. And they have this an interesting exchange where all of a sudden they realize, and, and she comes to understand, that despite all of their differences, you know, their ethnic identities, their gender, um, their status, all of these things that, that uh, they don't have in common and could be seen as barriers to relationship, she's able to transcend all of those and understand that Jesus has something to offer her. Jesus has something to offer her that will re-offer her new life. And she has this spiritual resurrection where she moves from being this outcast, this one who is, is um, being ostracized by the community, to being this powerful witness of Jesus Christ in the world. Where we're, t- we're told that her village, that her community, that many because of her testimony became believers in Jesus and followers of Him. And so she experienced this this spiritual resurrection where she was once lost, but now she's found. She has her place as this beloved daughter of God. Some of you are aware of the story of Timothy. Timothy's story follows Easter each year. Timothy was a devoted follower of Jesus, He was one of those uh, disciples, those folks that had committed themselves to following Jesus and growing in His ways and learning and understanding who He was. Well, after the resurrection, when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room, Thomas wasn't there. When Thomas comes back, the disciples are all excited and they're like, Thomas, Jesus lives. He was here. We met Him. If you remember the story, Thomas is basically, yeah, right. You you think I'm going to believe that? No way. Until I can see him with my own eyes and I can, you know, touch the wounds in his hands and his side, I don't believe it. And yet, he had an encounter with the risen Christ. And Thomas' life was transformed. He had this spiritual re- resurrection where he was once blind, but now he sees. It's how God's grace works in our lives. And it's that grace that that allows us to have these resurrection experiences where we become new people in Jesus Christ. You know, one of the most powerful stories is the story of Paul himself who who wrote the passage of Scripture. Tradition says he wrote the passage of Scripture that uh, Pastor Kelly read for us this morning. I mean, Paul was so convinced that he was right that he knew, he knew what was right. And he ended up becoming persecutors of the followers of the way, of those people who had committed themselves to the ways of Jesus. And it wasn't until he had this powerful confrontation with, with the risen Christ that literally knocked him to the ground, took away his sight, gave him an opportunity to reflect on his relationship with God and who he was and who Christ was, when all of a sudden he was born to this new life, where he had this powerful spiritual resurrection, where Paul committed himself to proclaiming the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ to all the world, and there's been no more powerful witness to the resurrected Christ than Paul. Paul had this powerful testimony. No no one except for Jesus has had the impact that Paul has had in terms of sharing this good news of God's love to the world. But Paul needed to see in a new way. The film we're discussing this week is the film Wonder. Would you raise your hand if you've seen the movie Wonder? Okay, not, yeah, only probably about 20% of us. I would recommend you see that film. It is a powerful, powerful film. The, the film Wonder is about a boy named August Pullman, and everybody calls him Augie. Augie was born with a rare genetic defect, 
which resulted in him, his face being very disfigured. Augie had dozens of operations on his face. You know, on his eyes, on his mouth, on his nose, on his ears. And those operations, you know, made an incredible difference to Augie. But according to the superficial ways the world sees, Augie is ugly. In fact, we're told that Augie, sometimes children will start crying when they see his face. You know, adults and children alone, they see Augie and they just look away. The story, the story picks up after uh, as Augie's entering middle school and he's been homeschooled all of these years. And the story is about Augie going to middle school, experiencing all kinds of bullying, and it's about how that community comes to see Augie in a new way. Augie comes to see himself in a new way. And not only does Augie, but also the community, if you will, has a spiritual resurrection where they were once blind, but now they see. The movie Wonder does an incredible job of helping us understand how often we judge people and how often we have um, these impulses and these instincts in us that don't honor God, don't bless one another, and that we need to die to if we're going to be resurrected to the new life that uh, God desires for us. One of the most powerful scenes in that movie, is, or, one of, or I shouldn't say, one of, the, one of the scenes in that movie that is basically the, the thesis of the movie takes place with Augie's English teacher. And Augie's English teacher, is, she, he has these precepts that he's going to, he, he, he introduces to the class over the course of the year. And one of the precepts is, and this basically becomes the thesis of the movie, it's whenever you have the choice between being right and being kind, choose kindness. Because all of us face hard lives. You'll notice on the posters often, if you've seen posters for the movie or on the disc, you know, it's choose kindness. The resurrected life and this idea of the choices we make is part of what Pastor Kelly read for us this morning in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul is writing to a community and he's telling them that they have the choice. They have a choice to make in how they live their lives. And he's telling them that the key to making those choices has to do with how we see the world. And so if how we see the world is the key and we need to change the way that we see the world, how do we do that? If, uh, if how we see things is instrumental to our Christian faith and life like Paul suggests that it is, how do we change how we see the world? Well, the very first thing Paul says is the first thing we need to do is we need to seek Christ. That one of the keys for us to be able to see the world differently is we need to seek Christ. Think about how that woman at the well, I mean, one of the powerful aspects of her story is that she was a spiritual seeker. You know, she has this interaction with Jesus where she's, she's talking about that this was her ancestor's well and how can you offer something that Jacob didn't. She was one who wanted to know who God was and she was seeking the ways of God. And it was the very fact that she was a seeker that positioned herself to be in a place where she could experience new life. How about Timothy? Timothy was open to new evidence. Timothy, he, he sought Christ. He was open to new evidence and his willingness to be open to that new evidence was part of what helped him change his life. Second thing Paul says is that we need to die to certain things. Paul says there's things such as Alice or malice and anger and abuse of language. There are things that we need to change, that we need to die to, if we're going to be the people that God calls us to. 
You know, what did, what did Paul need to die to? He needed to die to his anger. He needed to die to his, his, his self-righteousness and his judgmental, how judgmental he was. It was only when Paul was able to die to those things that he was able to move into the new life that God intended for him. So if we're going to see differently, the first thing we need to do is we need to seek Christ. The second thing we need to do is we need to die to those things that separate us from God and our neighbor. And then the third thing that Paul instructs us to do is that we need to choose. We need to choose from those things that are above, which is another way of saying we need to choose those things that are of Christ. And he talks about how we need to choose humility. We need to choose meekness. We need to choose kindness. Part of what the movie Wonder is about is about how people made that decision to choose kindness over being right. One of the most powerful is I was reflecting on this movie and I was reflecting on my own spiritual resurrections. One that has stuck with me that has just been you know, instrumental to me has to do with the idea of what it means to be patient. Paul talks about how we need to choose patience. That that is one of the things that comes to us as a gift from above. My very first, uh, my very first appointment as a United Methodist pastor was at Belgrade Avenue Church, which is down in North Mankato. And one of my responsibilities was, um, was helping lead the youth ministry in that church. And I was a father with young children. Uh, Jacob was, was um, a one-year-old, and, and Luke was a four-year-old, and Paige was a seven-year-old. And do you, remember those, do you remember those years of parenthood? Just, I mean, it's just, it's demanding, it's relentless, it's just, you know, it's all day, it's every day. Well, I remember being home um, with the kids, and I remember just being at the end of my rope. I mean, I was just tired, I was frustrated, and um, I was just on the edge. And I remember I was just about ready to blow up, and when all of a sudden, it just, it, I had this, this Holy Spirit moment where all of a sudden I became convicted of the fact, you know what? When I was with other people's children, I was the most patient person you could ever imagine. I was always offering the very best of myself to those children. And I was patient and I was kind and I was loving. And all of a sudden I realized that that is also uh, what I needed to offer my own children. And that ended up becoming one of those spiritual, spiritual resurrections for me. When I died to whatever was that obsessio, that driving impulse in my life, that was allowing me to put the very best of what I had to offer into my ministry, into my work, into the church, into those students that I was working with and to come to the new life that part of what I was meant to do was to be the kind of godly father that offered my children that same kind of love and understanding and patience. It required me to see things in a new way. It required me to die to certain things and to be born to other things in order that I might know that spiritual resurrection in order that I might be moved from being lost to being found, from being blind to seeing, that I might move from death to new life in Jesus Christ. Part of what the movie Wonder is about is about how all of the characters in that movie are learned to see in a new way. The cool thing is, is as they start to be able to see Augie for who he is, not for the deformity, it's because of his uh, genetic condition. When they start to see his spirit and his heart and all of the qualities that make him a remarkable person, they also start to be transformed and to change and to come to new life. 
And it's interesting because each of the characters, the major characters in this movie, the way they break it out is into episodes. And each episode follows, you know, mom, dad, sister, you know, best friend, um, sister's best friend. Each and every one of those characters, ultimately what that story is about is being able to see with new eyes. To be able to come to that time when they die to that which keeps them from being fully the human beings that they are created to be. And they are being born or resurrected to the new life that God desires for us. You know, what have some been some of those spiritual resurrections that you've experienced? What have been those things that you've had to die to in order that you might be raised to the new life that God intends for you? What might be those things that you need to die to today? You know, what might be those things that are keeping you from being your very best self in Jesus Christ? What are those things that you need to die to in order that you can be clothed in those qualities that will help you be fully human as you were created to be? You know, the thing is, is it's unique to each and every one of us. And yet it's the new life that God calls each and every one of us to. In a moment, we're going to have some special music. And in it is this beautiful testament, a beautiful witness to our life in Christ. My hope is is that as you are ministered to by those words, and as you enter into this time of spiritual reflection, you will be able to celebrate the new life that God has called you to, And that your prayer might be is that you have the eyes to see in a new way that you might experience the spiritual resurrections that God desires for you today in this place and in this time. Amen.